Um, when you are in the last panel of a conference, you're always in the position or in the situation that almost everything has been said, although not by everybody. And um, when I, I had I have prepared a paper with a comprehensive uh, overview on various aspects, and after hearing Wendy's introductory talk, I thought, OMG, uh, this could be slightly uh, redundant, but uh, nevertheless, uh, as the audience uh, this afternoon is not completely identical uh, with that at the, the, the Graduate Center, I think we could start, we could take my paper as a kind of res resuming uh, uh, and balancing uh, uh, article of our talks. Um, I would like to take um, the older research on the Holocaust as a kind of starting point. Over the last two and a half decades, research in the Holocaust has experienced a veritable boom. This boom was strongly encouraged by new archival possibilities in Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War. But this phenomenon has also go hand in hand with new research trends, perspectives, and approaches which are markedly different from those that guided the pioneering work of the scholars who led the foundations of Holocaust studies. Raoul Hilberg's view on the Holocaust, for example, was very much shaped by the sources he had analyzed in the 1950s, in particular the files of German institutions. From this perspective, the murder of the European Jews involved a gradual process of definition, expropriation, concentration, and destruction, spurred on by the institutional and bureaucratic machinery of Nazi Germany. I quote Hilberg, the destruction of the Jews was a German deed. It was implemented in German offices in a German culture, end quote. Although Hilbeck acknowledged the participation of Nazi Germany's allies in the Holocaust, he conceived of this event almost exclusively through the lens of German sources and German institutions. He primarily focused on the bureaucratic institutions of the German state. The mobile killing units of SS and police, the so-called Einsatzgruppen, which had started killing Jews in Poland immediately at the beginning of September 1939, namely before Jews from this area had been defined, expropriated, or concentrated, were barely mentioned in his work since they did not fit into his institutional model. Hilberg's perspective on the Jewish victims was also largely shaped by the sources written and produced by German perpetrators. Although he never shared Hannah Arendt's strong condemnation of Jewish leaders for allegedly taking part in the destruction of their own people. In his work, the Jewish victims nevertheless predominantly appeared as a passive mass of people obediently following German orders. This reflected the way they had been portrayed in perpetrated sources, which Hilberg prioritized in his work and analysis. I quote him again, the perpetrator had the overview, he alone was the key, it was through his eyes that I had to view the happening from its genesis to its culmination. That the perpetrator's perspective was the primary path to be followed became a doctrine for me, which I never abandoned." End quote. Hilbeck was aware, however, that the events of the Holocaust had also been a social process, and this led him to formulate three basic categories that could be applied to the people involved perpetrator, victim, and bystander. The triad has been widely used, and these categories are still considered valid as rough differentiators. Yet, Hilberg's triad proves somewhat too static to capture the multitude of people involved and their dynamically changing roles, which come into view when we analyze the Holocaust as social process. The shortcomings of the category of the bystander are particularly obvious if one considers the case of societies where the political order expects citizens to endorse the exclusion of particular groups of people by, for example, stimulating the personal goals and material interests of the majority. However, it, it is not my intention here to criticize Hilberg's groundbreaking work, which cannot be praised sufficiently. 
By mentioning him, I simply wanted to highlight some of the differences between older and current research and perspectives. In what follows, I would like to discuss in more detail seven of these fundamental changes and trends. The first trend, new trends in perpetrator research. For a long time, the typical perpetrator of the Holocaust was embodied by the type of the so-called desk murderer, a bureaucrat working in the institutions of a modern state. Accordingly, the Holocaust itself was conceived of as a mechanized and highly organized form of killing represented by the deportations by train and death camps like Auschwitz. However, when the focus of research shifted to the killing fields of Eastern Europe, a completely different type of perpetrator came into view, the face-to-face -face murderer in mobile killing units. Discussions uh, of the Holocaust uh, therefore no longer revolve primarily around topics like the inherent amorality of modern bureaucracies or the connection between industrialized murder and modernity. Instead, attention has been turned to the mechanisms of group cohesion and social psychological processes in perpetrator units. In particular, importance has been given to the role of comradeship based on the radical distinction between an us and a them. In other words, Auschwitz as a synonym for an almost clinical form of killing in gas chambers without a personal confrontation between perpetrators and their victims no longer dominates the view on the Holocaust, although it's quite clear that Auschwitz still is a topic of absolutely paramount importance for the history of the Holocaust. The cruel reality of mass murder during the Holocaust now also includes killing by bullets and almost archaic and bloody massacres which had long been ignored. With this historiographical shift from the center in Berlin to the periphery in Eastern Europe, attention has also been drawn to non-German perpetrators such as Balts, Poles and Ukrainians who served in auxiliary police units and were deeply involved in mass killings, or to the Croatian Ustasha and the Romanian army that killed hundreds of thousands of Jews on their own account and without the need for any German order. What we can observe then, and was already mentioned in the conference, is a kind of Europeanization of the Holocaust. The Holocaust has evolved from a distinctively German genocide into a more European phenomenon. This remarkable change of perspective undoubtedly offers new insights into various forms of mass violence in Eastern Europe. However, it also requires striking a careful balance, since the fundamental role of Nazi Germany should not be overlooked. It is important to know that Ukrainian police, for instance, participated in the Holocaust, but they would have never found themselves in the position to do so without the German occupation of the Ukraine. Still, no history of the Holocaust can be written without accounting for the role of Germany, Hitler, and the leaders of the Nazi regime. Coming to the second point, a more differentiated view of the victims. In earlier research, little attention was paid to the behavior of victims during the Holocaust. The discussions concentrated on the role of Jewish leaders and Jewish councils who were often sharply criticized. However, few researchers took the everyday life of Jews under persecution, their coping strategies and struggle for survival into account. Meanwhile, the discovery of ego documents such as diaries and reports that survived in underground archives like the Ringelblum archives in the Warsaw Ghetto have shed new light on the enormous variety of individual attitudes on the significance of gender and age and on the cultural diversity of the Jewish victims who thereby no longer appear as a uniform mass of people. Even in a context of severe repression under the dire conditions of life in a ghetto, many Jewish inmates try to sustain a private life as well as cultural and religious practices in order to preserve and defend their identity against the heteronomy imposed by the perpetrators. This history of the victims from below has also explored early forms of documentation, victims' attempts to bear witness for posterity. This work of documentation continued immediately after the survivors' liberation and has produced an enormous amount of sources from the perspective of the victims, which still holds a great deal of potential for researchers. Coming to the third aspect, the Holocaust as a social process. 
The everyday history of the Holocaust from below has also revealed an enormous variety of social attitudes in European societies, far beyond what the static category of the bystander suggests. The Nazis and their allies established new social norms, including racial hierarchies and social models such as the ethnically homogeneous national community, the Volksgemeinschaft in German. This devalued traditional norms that conferred social status or merit on individuals according to their property, education, and achievements. The new social norms generated intense social processes and dynamically changing roles. Under the ever-changing pressures of violence, war, and occupation that prevailed under Nazi or their allies' rule, people's position could change from one moment to the next. They were seldom fixed. In occupied Poland, where more than 200,000 Jews had gone into hiding, Polish rescuers could even turn into murderers when the hidden Jews were running out of money or when Polish helpers feared brutal retaliation by the Germans. In these cases, many Jews were killed by the Polish blue police without the Germans knowing to avoid them executing the Polish helpers. Recent research has therefore rightly concentrated on these social processes and hybrid forms of behavior and action that are crucial for analyzing the Holocaust as a social process. Replacing the term bystander with dozens of more subtly differentiated categories such as beneficiaries, opportunists, indifferent spectators and others that share the static category of the bystander is therefore not enough. We should not classify people. Instead, we should have a close look on social behavior and social actions and dynamically changing roles. My fourth aspect is question lost in spaces of violence and in bloodlands, question mark. The shift in focus of Holocaust research towards Eastern Europe, along with the cultural and spatial turns, has brought up new interpretive models for contextualizing the Holocaust within a broader context of mass and inter-ethnic violence in Eastern Europe. Historians have, for example, applied the concept of spaces of violence to many East European regions in order to emphasize the continuity of various practices of violence in which the Holocaust should be embedded. Undoubtedly, this spatial turn offers new possibilities for the contextualization of the Holocaust. However, these models also suggest that violence is something self-perpetuating and self-explanatory. The reason for violence is simply violence, and the space itself tends to become an actor. One should not forget that the Holocaust was not limited to one specific territory, and that the main perpetrators aimed at the unprecedented annihilation of a people. As S. leader Heinrich Himmler had put it like this, we had to take the difficult decision to let these people disappear from Earth, end quote. The dynamics of violence in Eastern Europe cannot explain the deportation of Jews from Greek islands, from the Netherlands, or from France. Therefore, the comparison of the Holocaust with other forms of mass violence in these territories can only be taken so far. Timothy Snyder has used the term bloodlands to draw attention to the interaction of Nazi and Stalinist mass violence in East European borderlands. In so doing, he presents the area as the experimental field of radical totalitarian regimes. The genocidal impulses in this model mainly come from outside the bloodlands and the people living there are primarily pre presented as victims of Nazi and Stalinist oppression. This undoubtedly has lots of truth in it. However, these regions had also been the breeding ground for radical forms of nationalism and ideals of homogeneity that Nazism and Stalinism could exploit. In this connection, it is worth briefly mentioning the contribution of ethnic Germans living in Eastern Europe to the formation of Nazi ideology. It is no accident that the Nazi chief ideologue, Alfred Rosenberg, came from the Baltic states. He was the man who introduced the notion of an alleged Jewish Bolshevism into Nazi theory. During the Holocaust, his ministry for the occupied Eastern territories was staffed with many ethnic and Baltic Germans who had grown up in a multi-ethnic environment in Central and Eastern Europe. They nevertheless endorsed radical forms of exclusion and mass murder. 
Of course, neither did the multi-ethnic character of Eastern Europe and its diversity automatically cause or provoke conflicts, nor did they necessarily radicalize genocidal initiatives. Yet it would be too simplistic to present the people living there as mere objects of outward violent intervention. My fifth point is the achievements and limits of internationalization. Over the last couple of decades, the Holocaust has become a truly international and also interdisciplinary field of research. This contrasts with older research, which had been characterized by particularly national perspectives and different national collective memories. While for German researchers, for example, the guiding question had always been, how could this have happened? Israeli scholars tended to ask, why did it happen to us? This gave rise to different emphasis in historical research. In Germany, the main focus was on the perpetrators and the development of the so-called final solution. In Israel, research concentrated on the victims and the history of anti-Semitism and many other topics. These national perspectives have by no means disappeared, but the internationalization of the research and the discussion has diminished their significance. This trend is reflected in German scholarship where research on the victims is no longer exceptional, but however mostly carried out by female colleagues uh, to mention this gender aspect. Further internationalization has been stimulated by many international conferences and workshops conducted by a multitude of institutions working in the field. Many of them have also built up a system of fellowships that has enabled scholars to discuss their research with colleagues from other countries. A few decades ago, the typical Holocaust scholar was an expert in German history with a good knowledge of German. This sufficed to read the German files and sources that were crucial to understanding of the genesis of the final solution. With changing research trends and a growing differentiation of perspectives, it is meanwhile more important to know languages like Yiddish, Polish, or Russian, and the growing number of Holocaust scholars of Eastern East European origin are personifying these new developments. The sources relevant for Holocaust research are written in at least two dozen languages, and this proves to be one of the biggest challenges and obstacles for recent research. Despite a growing internationalization, transnational and comparative perspectives are still rare. And I have to mention that this morning we have heard to some marvelous examples, by, by particularly the youngest scholars here. Um, experts on the Pol Holocaust in Poland often do not know anything about what had happened in France and vice versa, although such a comparative analysis would be both fruitful and necessary. The insularity and specialization of knowledge in many areas of research hinders an adoption of an integrated approach of the kinds of Friedlander proposed. These still remain an exception and a challenge. Growing requirements on the essential knowledge of various foreign languages have contributed to another remarkable trend, namely the expansion of aftermath studies, which often do not transcend national borders and pose the same kind of challenges. Meanwhile, two-thirds of the topics discussed at conferences on the Holocaust deal with this subject. Some scholars have criticized this as, I quote a German colleague, flight into aftermath studies. I do not share this view. This is certainly an exaggeration since the memorialization of the Holocaust, post-war trials against perpetrators, questions of restitution or the fate of survivors are an integral part of a comprehensive history of the Holocaust that should not be separated from its main incidents until 1945. However, the boom of aftermath studies is paired with a growing assumption that the Holocaust has already been sufficiently researched so that questions of impact, overall meaning, and interpretation appear to be more important for the present than Holocaust history, strictly speaking. My last point, the challenges of universalization, ritualization of memory, and nationalist functionalization. The boom of Holocaust research in the last 25 years coincided with a global memory culture that gave the Holocaust a central place and aimed at promoting universal human rights and strengthening the fight against genocide, ethnic cleansing, racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. 
However, today the achievements of critical research and reflective memory culture do no longer appear to be self-evident. On the one hand, they are endangered by the routines, set phrases, and formulas of a ritualized memory. I could give many German examples in this respect. I would like uh, to mention an American one. In the USA, for example, the statement from the White House on Holocaust Memorial Day 2017 points to this danger, namely the dehistoricization and arbitrary universalization of the Holocaust. The statement emphasized a vague fight against evil its reference to, I quote, victims, survivors, heroes of the Holocaust, end quote, avoided any explicit mention of either the murdered Jews or the perpetrators and collaborators. No mentioning of Jews, no mentioning of anti-Semitism, no mentioning of the Germans, no mentioning of the Nazis, no mentioning of the Second World War. In this way, critical memory culture is in danger to degenerate into meaningless ritual and, be, and to become a mere exercise of semantic duty. On the other hand, critical research and a reflective memory culture are increasingly challenged by right-wing populists and nationalistic movements. In Germany, the land of the perpetrators, the right-wing fringe polemicizes the, I quote, the daft politics of coping with the past and calls for a 180-degree turn in memory culture, luckily without much success yet. Right-wing and national conservative governments in Poland, Lithuania, and some other countries in Eastern Europe have instrumentalized the memory of the Holocaust and flexibly adapted it to a specific nationalist agenda. Terms like Holocaust or second genocide equate the Holocaust with the suffering of Poles or Lithuanians under German and Soviet occupation. Museums for indigenous rescuers of Jews or the legis or a legislation penalizing the use of specific terms and imposing linguistic rules by the state risk intimidating and silencing critical historians and propagate nationalistic historical narratives in which the nation merely consists of heroes, victims, and martyrs. There are no other gray zones between these categories. The achievements of critical research including that of many, many East European scholars who have done a lot to do critical research on the Holocaust, these achievements are dismissed or bluntly ignored. However, we should not accept a return to the historical narratives of the 1950s in which there was no place for the victims of the Holocaust, in which European societies portrayed themselves as the actual or the real victims of the Second World War, and in which a critical examination of society's wartime participation and willful ignorance of what was happening was avoided. Thank you very much for your attention. Tall. I don't know. Can I pull this down? Sorry. Ah, there we go. Yes. Uh, good after. Uh, good afternoon, and um, thank you all for being here on this uh, truly beautiful, uh, beautiful day. Uh, and I, I also want to express my uh, thanks to uh, to the organizers of this uh, really very. Uh, special conference, and particularly also to Patricia Nobe for her wonderful organizing, to Dagmar for agreeing to chair, uh, and to um, all of you uh, for, for coming. So uh, our topic uh, is the past and future of, uh, of Holocaust studies, a rather enormous topic. And I have to say that I um, think about that this question really very much also in terms of our present uh, on, on multiple levels. Of course, in terms of the scholarship and research that we've uh, been discussing for, for the past day and a half, um, but also I would 
really want us to uh, talk about maybe in the, uh, in the discussion, uh, about teaching, about uh, the place of the field of Holocaust studies in its interdisciplinary forms in the curriculum, uh, particularly, certainly, but not only in the US, uh, for our quite rapidly, sometimes feeling dramatically changing cohort of students, uh, students who for the most part certainly mine, uh, no longer have any necessary genealogical or cultural connection to the Holocaust and for that matter uh, to Europe. Uh, and so, and I, so I think teaching is very important. It's something that I've been very pleased to do here at certain times over the past years at the museum. It's always been a very special experience. Uh, and since we are here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, I think we might want to think also in the discussion about uh, the ways in which our, I think, ever more sophisticated and ever more sort of far-ranging and deeply, uh, deeply researched work uh, by scholars can um, be translated for a larger public uh, in terms of public history, public culture, and obviously in terms of uh, museum presentation. Uh, in December, some of us, Natalia was there as well, some of us were at a conference in London in honor of um, the late uh, um, and much more David Cesarani, and uh, the wonderful historian Tim Cole uh, gave a lecture also about the state of Holocaust studies. These lectures happen at a regular pace. Uh, and he called it Mind the Gap. Uh, and certainly, I think, uh, or the gaps, perhaps. And certainly, I think ma um, there is still a major gap between uh, the work that we do as historians, as scholars, and what gets communicated to uh, the, the public in, commemor in commemorative culture, in museums, in, um, in the media. I think that's mm -hmm. a huge challenge. Uh, so just to flag that. Mm -hmm. uh, I also um, think, uh, and this was actually strengthened for me during, uh, uh, during this uh, conference, that um, in some ways the future of Holocaust studies as we move uh, forward in the 21st century uh, is that it will become both less and more significant. Uh, uh, as time passes, and as our scholarship and our teaching and our students tilt further and further toward a transnational and global focus. Indeed, the Holocaust as a discrete set of historical events may well lose its privileged and despite, I think, all protestations to the contrary, sometimes still sacred space in 20th century history, even perhaps in Jewish history, but it will do so paradoxically uh, as a result of deeper, richer, more complex research such as has been presented at this conference that embeds the multifaceted aspects of the Holocaust in a longer and broader temporal and spatial framework. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna put a, a couple of maps here. Uh, and moreover, and I don't really have any illusions that this will be easy or unproblematic or not fraught, but I think that as we do that, as we embed the Holocaust in this longer and broader framework, we will also actually be better able to preserve, lots of anxiety about preserving, um, and give new meaning to the specific memories of the Holocaust. Uh, that so many of us, and museums and memorial sites, I think, in particular, find this a challenge, are scrambling uh, to preserve with the passing of the last survivors, and do that for new and more diverse, more multicultural audiences who have long since moved beyond what we used to rather smugly, and even cynically, people talking about Shoah business, uh, when we thought we could afford to be cynical about such matters, I don't think we think that anymore, uh, that we would refer to as the memory boom or the inevitably cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust. I think that that boom has 
absolutely past and this sort of assumption that there is a necessarily cosmopolitan memory that is shared in some ways uh, transnationally, I think that that is um, no longer the case and that will be a challenge. So we can and will no longer think the Holocaust outside of a more comparative history of genocide, war, displacement, and refugees across time and space. This conference, in fact, has already, it seemed to, seems to me, acknowledged this shift with two compelling panels on genocides in comparison, patterns of ethnic and religious violence in the contemporary, and as we heard from Ben Kiernan, not only contemporary, also pre-modern world, and um, this morning on the question of reparations, um, prosecutions, and prevention in historical and contemporary context, as well as, and Frank has already mentioned it, uh, an excellent transnationally oriented graduate student panel. So having, um, having said that, I just want to briefly try to highlight uh, two issues that are very, as you might know from Dagmar's description of what I'm working on, uh, that are very close to my heart and mind. Uh, and the first, uh, in fact, addresses this temporal and spatial uh, remapping and the ways in which we are expanding the chronological and geographical parameters. And the second involves new or rediscovered, Natalia spoke about some of this uh, very wonderfully eloquently yesterday, uh, new or rediscovered research on gender, sexuality, sexual violence, and coercion, which I think uh, we are now delving into more deeply, finding new sources, understanding older sources differently, taking another look, um, in part, uh, perhaps, as part of what one journalist, Marissa fox bellak -Viva, has recently tentatively termed in the forward um, as a, quote, Holocaust Me Too moment. Mm -hmm. because, because questions of sexuality and uh, sexual violence raise in extreme form the questions about power, violation, but also desire and consent now roiling public debate. And both of these themes point to questions about memory, when it was formed, how it has been codified and communicated, as well as the contested place of the Holocaust in presentist discussions mm -hmm. of comparative genocide and multiple registers of violence. So just in terms of the first point, the temporal shift, we are certainly questioning conventional periodizations. We have noted, for example, that liberation and its aftermath come at different times in different places and carry many different meanings. For example, continued and renewed trauma and the da danger of violence uh, facing uh, pogroms and threats, for example, for example, the, of the returning Jews in Eastern Europe, and certainly also uh, for women confronting uh, new sexual violence uh, with the mass rapes committed by the Red Army. It's also important to remember the kind that really, and again, we know this, but we don't always keep it in our minds, uh, the, or our students don't, the dramatic dissimultaneities that characterize both the wartime and the post-war designations. Mm -hmm. We know Hungarian Jews were deported to their death as the Red Army was already liberating Nazi-occupied mm -hmm. territory. Mm -hmm. And um, Polish Jewry was exterminated and and, Pol and, um, and uh, Jewish, and at the same time that this is happening, Jewish leaders, or for that matter, the U.S. government uh, war refugee board, fin established finally in January 1944, was still imagining that many of the Jews of Europe could still be saved. And inmates of concentration camps on the territory of the German Reich were being evacuated to Sweden, even as others were being murdered and shot on death marches. Polish Jews were still stuck in Siberia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, waiting for repatriation, while the direct survivors of Nazi occupation were already organizing themselves in central committees, in historical commissions, in Zionist organizations in Poland, and then in the early DP camps. And it's only really when the repatriates from the Soviet Union finally cross the borders back into Poland or Czechoslovakia that they begin to understand, having spent the war in that blank space, mm -hmm. that's the blank space on the map behind the lines, uh, finally cross the borders back into Poland or Czechoslovakia or 
uh, that they begin to comprehend that the more, quote, normal, and we had a conversation already about normalizing, that the, quote, um, more normal torments of wartime and refugee life, hunger, disease, repression, fear, terror, they had suffered in their Soviet exile or refuge, that those experiences actually were lucky in comparison to the vast graveyard left behind by the final solution they confronted when they returned to the post-war. So the lines between war and post-war, both geographical and chronological, are local, diffuse, and contingent. I think we're starting to better understand how variable even the time frame was for the scale and totality of the catastrophe to really sink in, including for Jewish leaders in the US or the Yeshuv. Mm -hmm. Moreover, as we look at um, these remapped terms, the Holocaust is kind of the defining event of 20th century German history. Mm -hmm at times recede somewhat in a longer durée discussion of emancipation, anti-Semitism, ethno-nationalism, mm -hmm. through the dramatic events of World War I, the post-war settlements, uh, the experience of Jews in, with the League of Nations and the minority rights system, uh, post-war to a 1948 moment, for example, marked by so many dramatic events, the intensification of the Cold War with its implications for justice and memory in both Eastern and Western Europe, the beginning of the end of the DP era, the establishment of the State of Israel, and of course what we discussed in this conference, the Genocide Convention and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I think this question of the contingency of time is something that we need to think about. And yes, the spatial shift that um, Frank has mentioned, uh, we are indeed remapping where people died and where they survived, expanding the geographical parameters. Uh, so that's an even broader map. Uh, we are acknowledging that the tragically small majority of East European, mostly Polish Jews who survived, did so precisely because they escaped Nazi occupation in the harsh, inadvertent refuge of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, that's the expanded map, beginning to investigate seriously the transnational, indeed global dimensions of flight, relief, and rescue, especially in non-Western and colonial spaces. Mm -hmm. For quite some time now, of course, Holocaust historiography has been gripped by this spatial turn eastward. We've heard about that. From uh, Central Europe, from Ber Germany, uh, from the, to, to the periphery, from Berlin and Auschwitz to the killing fields or bloodlands of Eastern Europe and the occupied Soviet Union, and then to the world uh, behind the lines, the one that I had just showed you before. Uh, Wendy uh, spoke in her uh, opening lecture, which by the way, you can all read in tablet, it's online, I just found it. Um, Wendy spoke of the Europeanization of the Holocaust, and Frank mentioned it again. I think um, that we are you know, most obviously only now starting to come to terms with the fact, and this has much to do with this turn to the East in our research, that indeed the majority of the Sherry Tapleta, many of you have heard me say this many times, um, that was gathered finally as the survivors, DPs, uh, in allied occupied Europe were indeed mostly Polish Jews who had survived by twists of geopolitical fate. Uh, first in the Soviet-occupied parts of Poland, and then as a result of Stalinist deportation to the interior, and where they then finally escaped the Nazi onslaught into the bloodlands, uh, and in turn migrated further behind the lines to the Tashkent front in Central Asia, where they encountered this dizzying mix of people, uh, including local Jews, evacuated Soviet Jews, Polish Poles. Uh, this is and if we think further about expanding our topography, uh, we will include as well as we are the non-Ashkenazi world from, Gre from Greece to Salonika to the Iberian Peninsula, to the Middle East, to East Asia, and North Africa, which received refugees and then produced so many encounters with multiple others. Uh, so I think that in some ways the connections that have been made at this conference to studies of comparative genocide 
um, in fact, mm -hmm. become more interesting and more complex if we do take seriously the fact that most of the people, uh, certainly from Eastern Europe, that we have come to identify as survivors only, um, only managed to attain that status precisely because they had escaped Nazi occupation. Uh, these are the survivors coming, the repatriates coming back from um, Poland after having been repatriated. And here you see these are images of um, Polish Jews in a forced labor camp uh, in um, north, the, uh, near the Arctic Circle in the Soviet Union or on a uh, kolkhoz in Kazakhstan. Um, they had, in fact, not directly experienced genocide but they faced its consequences and they had to live with those consequences. I think there's uh, a lot of still anxiety about thinking in those terms, especially now with the, revi with the revival of xenophobia and anti-Semitism um, anti and authoritarian populism uh, in Europe. Um, and as this gen the generation with any living memory inexorably disappears, those committed to preserving memory fear that post-war accusations positioning most Jew Jewish DPs as refugees from communism or as economic migrants and not necessarily genuine victims of Nazism might be reactivated. If the majority of survivors had in fact experienced the more normal horrors of wartime rather than the particular catastrophe of the Shoah, then this scenario suggests the unique nature of Jewish persecution is obscured. However, I would submit a precisely opposite conclusion would emerge, that understanding how very, very, very few direct survivors there really were, and that most, if much, if not most, of the saved remnant had survived only because it had escaped Nazi control, mm -hmm. only underscores mm -hmm. the deadly sweep of the final solution. And we can also, I think, understand a very critical difference between Jews who ended up in Central Asia, for example, and non-Jewish Poles who joined them there, uh, which is that when they returned, they crossed a border into Poland, into a country that was not only war-torn and filled with individual losses, but it was the Jews who returned to this total, it seemed, graveyard where it, everything, virtually everything was gone. Family, home, community, culture. In that sense, a definition of genocide. They faced its consequences. So I think that telling the story about survival behind the lines in non -Western and in non-Western spaces, mm -hmm. here sitting in a chaykhane, in a tea house, uh, in Bukhara, in um, Uzbekistan, um, will shift the ways in which we explore precisely the intersections among, um, OK, I've got my five minute warning coming. Um, we explore precisely the intersections between Holocaust scholarship, genocide, and histories of mass violence and attempts as prevention, as well as connections to history of, histories of colonialism, totalitarianism, <laughs> We already talked about the vexed questions about comparisons between Stalinism and National Socialism. Another key part, and that's why I've just turned to this, um, this is the camp of the Tehran children uh, out on the outskirts of Tehran and Iran, um, facing you, the mountains of um, Mount Demavent in the background. Um, and another photo of refugees in Iran in the, in the early 1940s. This, um, I think that a key part of the transnational turn that I'm talking about is what I would call, and again, we started to hear about this this morning, especially in a wonderful paper um, by Kimberly Cheng, a colonial or perhaps an imperial turn in Holocaust studies. This means highlighting not only the Eastern Front and Germany's own imperial expansionist visions, but the critical role of empire, most obviously the declining British empire on the Indian subcontinent in Africa and Mandai Palestine and the rest of the Middle East, but also the French empire and also, for example, post-colonial China. By investigating the experiences of Jewish refugees in non-Western societies, we will need to think more about the fact that regions 
these are my parents, by the way, in Iran, in the <laughs> desert, um, that we will need to think about uh, the fact that regions we now may associate with barbarism or with anti-Semitism uh, and from which people are fleeing Aleppo, are fleeing barbarism, and others fear that those fleeing are transporting their barbarism with them into a civilized West, that precisely those areas were those mm -hmm. that once offered refuge to mm -hmm. those fleeing a barbarism mm -hmm. that emanated not from those um, non-West, that's my alarm, um, five <laughs> minutes, um, not from those uh, uh, non-Western areas, uh, but in fact from Europe. So um, I think we will need to think uh, a lot harder about the intersection of race, racism, uh, and the Jewish Holocaust experience, and the often problematic ways, here, the bazaar in Isfahan, the often problematic ways in which Jewish refugees encountered the other. If the Holocaust underscored the ways in which Jews were constructed as racial inferiors, the circumstances of their flight and rescue in non-Western refuges, from Tsosua to Bombay to Tehran to La Paz to Shanghai, and the fact that virtually all wanted to leave again as soon as they possibly could for places where their neighbors would once again be white and less exotic, underscore Jews' precarious but real privilege as white. So I think we need to think more about the ways in which race and racism played out for Jewish refugees and survivors. You can think about Marion Kaplan's work on Sasua, Shirley Gilbert's on South Africa, this morning's paper by Kim Rooley on Jews' vision of Shanghai. Um, I think we also will um, need to think more about um, doing fine. Take, take three. It's okay. okay. Uh, literal, uh, the importance of literal space and material sites. Uh, this vast landscape of ghettos and camps uh, from little known labor camps in the Sudetenland populated mostly by young women and girls were just starting to learn about the sexual abuse they faced to Stalinist labor camps to British internment camps. Here's a self-made uh, little um, badge of, of, uh, of be, that says has a Jewish star and says prisoner of war and lists all the British internment camps a German Jewish refugee uh, was in uh, to allied DP camps uh, to ghettos with different levels of horror uh, to the um, from the Warsaw Riga Lodge transit camps, Transi, Westerbork, uh, to, for example, the open ghetto of Japanese-occupied Shanghai, very different, and yet with features. Finally, my last um, paragraph here, that I think that the turn to, as we've already said, soft sources, is indeed mm -hmm. unearthing what has been increasingly less, the marginalized and the taboo, especially in terms of sexuality. And the spectrum of sexuality and sexual violence, the instrumental uses of sexuality as survival tools about complex relationships that might incorporate within extreme conditions and coercion, also affection, desire, queer histories uh, developed under extreme conditions, hard questions about the breakdown of mores, Sarah Horowitz's work, Natalia's work. The gray areas emerge so clearly when we look at the spheres of gender and sexuality. And we have so many effects in the aftermath, these questions of creating new families, uh, the, uh, the cost of creating new families after loss, uh, the painful and often tragically unsuccessful processes of, of family reunification, stories that are too often obscured by the family portraits offered by later interviews, the Shoah Foundation interviews, or the candle lighting ceremonies at Yom HaShoah commemorative events, which sort of celebrate the continuity of family and really efface questions of rupture. So we need to think about relational histories that acknowledge entangled connections with Jewish and non-Jewish neighbors, whether they be East European Christians, Muslims and local Jews in Central Asia, Hindus and Muslims, or British or Japanese colonial administrators in South and East Asia. So we need to decenter Germany, I think, but also decenter Europe. And when we do that, we will 
open up debates that simultaneously highlight the singularity of the final solution while also normalizing and opening to comparison with other catastrophes, Jews experience a forced migration and wartime deprivation. And this, I hope, would help us to understand the Holocaust as well as our current refugee crisis and debates and efforts to prevent genocide more deeply and comprehensively as we think about the future of Holocaust studies. Thank you. I, <coughs> sorry, uh, I have to tell you that I am also very pleased to be here and uh, maybe as a last speaker, I have the privilege to criticize a little bit the organizers. First of all, uh, Professor Randolph Brehem, my mentor and friend. Last summer, he asked me to speak about the Hungarian and Polish Holocaust memory policy. In the second row here, at least three eminent historians spoke about this topic already. So I am the fourth, and I took notes where they already spoke about the topic, and they mentioned some very interesting things that I wanted to speak about. The same thing I will repeat. So, um, the clicker. Yeah. Oh. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I changed a little bit the title of my intervention The Holocaust and the Holocaust Memory Policy in Poland and Hungary. Mm -hmm. A few words about. about Poland. Yes. Before the Second World War, it was in this country strong anti-Semitism, nationalism, the population is overwhelming majority Roman Catholic. 33 million people out of this more than three and three million and three hundred Jews. A weak assimilation, strong Zionism, and Orthodox Yiddish-speaking Jewry. And this was a multi-ethnic society, about 7 million Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, and so on. Poland was a weak ally of the Western powers, no sign of gratitude for its independence, regained after World War I. Even state collaboration with Nazi Germany, occupation and annexation of Teshen in November 1938. During the Second World War, he was the, it was the first victim of Hitler and Stalin. The victims, the number of the victims, approximately the official, according to official estimation, the right-wing estimation, around 6 million, according to Timothy Snyder, 4.8 million was the victims. Hungary. Hungary was the greatest loser of the First World War. After the First World War, became a nationalist, anti-communist country. And we have, we live with this Trianon, so-called Trianon trauma. Mm -hmm. Maybe the elder one, the senior one, remember the mm -hmm. famous Beatles song, you say yes, I say no, you say hello, I say goodbye. You say Trianon, I say Holocaust. You say persecution of the Jews, I say persecution of Hungarian minority. This is the competitive victimhood and the right-wing Hungarian politicians and intellectuals today and for more than seven decades they claim that the Western liberal democratic powers betrayed, punished the innocent Hungary, who was in the central powers, one of the central powers during the First World War, and we were the loser side. And second claim, they claim the right-wing politicians, the Western powers betrayed, abandoned, exploited Hungary after 
World War II and even after the collapse of the communist regime. Hungary was a reluctant ally of Germany. In Hungary was a strong anti-Semitism. In 1939, during the last free parliamentary elections, the majority of the members of the parliaments were anti-Semites. Between 38 and 42, we had 22 anti-Semite laws, several hundreds decrees, one massacre, Novi Sad, January 1942, introduced the military force of labor, and we had one deportation, around 16,000 people, to Kamenetsk Bodolsky, they were massacred in July, August 1941. But we had no ghettos, no yellow star, no mass deportation before occupation of Hungary by the Germans in March 1944. We had a very popular leader. He is very popular now, and he was very popular before and during the Second World War, Regent Miklos Horthy. Mainly his popularity due to the peaceful re-annexation of some parts of the lost territories with the help of Hitler and Mussolini. After the end of the Second World War, we, we Hungarians again find ourselves at the loser side. We had at least 500,000, maybe 550,000 Jews deaths. The military deaths is 340,000 out of the population of 13 million and 700 people. Some 600,000 people were deported to the Soviet Union and approximately 200,000 perished there. The Holocaust memory policy in Hungary since 1945 in Hungary, we had, remember, since 1945, when the overwhelming majority in the countries, in the United States, in the future Israel, or the Western Europe, had no Holocaust studies, books, or something, a memory of the Holocaust. We had path-breaking studies, books, documentary accounts, memories, films, dramas, and after the 56th revolution in Hungary, we had a cultural policy of the three T team. This is in Hungarian, Turt Tamogato Tolerat, translated the cultural policy of the three T's, take it, tolerate, and support. From the early 60s, the scientific Holocaust research belonged to the tolerated category. In, United States, here in New York, by the Columbia University Press in 1981, was published Randolph Braham, Politics of Genocide. One of the leading Hungarian historians, George Ranki, he is also a Holocaust survivor. This book should have been written by a Hungarian historian, wrote in his review. After 1990, nationalism, anti-Semitism, whitewashing, rewrite history in Hungary and Poland. We, the true 100% Poles, Hungarians, Christians, suffered at least as much as the Jews, who in their majority were communist, collaborators of the Soviet Union after the liberation, claimed the right-wing intellectuals. Prime Minister Orban, during his first premiership since 19 eight till 2002, and since 2010 till the eternity. His official nominated personal historian is Dr. Maria Schmidt. He, she has a very popular museum since 2002, it was inaugurated by Prime Minister Orban. More than four million people visited in Budapest this museum. According to Maria Schmidt, this museum is about the brave Hungarians, the resistant victims of Nazis and communists. 
This is the competitive martyrology, competitive victimhood. According to Maria Schmidt, we have spoken enough about the Hungarian perpetrators. Now we have to focus on, on the Hungarian right shows among the nations. We have 844 Hungarian right shows nominated by the Yad Vashem. Tolerated in Hungary, the scientific research supported research about the Hungarian rescuers. We have no Holocaust bill up to now. The memorial of the German occupation, it was not inaugurated in April 2014. It represents Hungary as Gabriel Archangel, innocent victim of the Nazi Germany, the devilish, devilish eagle attacking the innocent Hungary. And according to Prime Minister Orban, Regent Horty was an exceptional statesman, the greatest savior of Jews of Budapest after the deportation of some 437 Jews, thousands, 437,000 Jews from the countryside. And Horty stopped the deportations. He is the one and only East European statesman who, when he was finally informed about the fate of the deported Jews, got the Auschwitz Protocols on July 2nd, 1944, ordered Colonel Ferenc Kosorus to clean the Hungarian gendarmes from the capital, July 6, 1944. Why did Horty suspend, not stop, the deportations? He had at least four different reasons. Deteriorating military situation, the strong protest, scandal in foreign press, warning from Roosevelt, Churchill, Pius XII, and Hungarian friends. Believed if the capital will be Judenfrei, free of Jews, the Allies would carpet bombing the capital. Believed the gendarmes some 3,000 disciplined men planned some kind of putsch against him. The byproduct was temporary, the deportation were suspended. On July, no. Oh, sorry, I was in a, such a rush. This is. Uh, on July 7, 2015, Laszlo Kövér, right hand of Orban and president of the Hungarian parliament, Csaba Hende, defense minister, inaugurated the bust of Kosorus, the colonel who saved the Budapest Jews, some 200 meters from the residence of the president of, president of Hungary. Defense minister Hende declared Kosorus showed the real face of the Hungarian nation. This, this is what I called the historical pollution, memorial pollution of the environmental pollution of uh, Hungary. We have uh, several such statues, street named after uh, real or imagined saviors of the Jews. Budapest is full of such kind of uh, memorial plaques and so on. So to return to Poland, uh, I have five more minutes? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Five, only five. So uh, I will jump on my conclusion. You only uh, have seven. Seven? Okay. <laughs> okay. I will show at least uh, the quote during our uh, conference. It was quoted several times, Professor uh, Grabowski uh, and uh, Professor Gross. Uh, so I can show at least uh, their uh, faces. Uh, and uh, I will show uh, these two eminent uh, professors uh, and uh, next to them, there is uh, the actual uh, Polish Prime Minister, uh, Mateusz Morawiecki, uh, who admitted that the timing of the bill adoption, it was the 28th of January 2000, this year. This is 
the International Holocaust Memorial Day, uh, it was, uh, the timing was unfortunate, according mm -hmm. to Morawiecki. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hungary, on the same day, in Hungary was planned a memorial mass in a Catholic church in the downtown of Budapest for Horty, who was a reformed uh, face. The, but this uh, planned memorial mass was cancelled, postponed after the first reactions of Hungarian historians, the leader of the Hungarian Jewish congregation, uh, the reaction of foreign press, American and Israeli statesmen, and so on. To return to the uh, Polish uh, Holocaust bill, uh, Jonathan asked uh, this uh, morning that if what will be uh, what will be the fate of the historians who dare to speak about the Polish, uh, not the Polish uh, death camps. Uh, this is uh, incorrect. Uh, this, these camps were run, organized, uh, manipulated by the Germans. So on Polish soil, but I never used uh, Polish death camps uh, as an expression. Uh, but uh, what will be the, the fate of the historians who dare to speak about not the Polish nation as a uh, nation who committed uh, crimes, but about Poles, who was collaborators uh, of the Nazi Germany, uh, I think they will be not jailed. So the historians and the artists, uh, it's, as a part of scholarly activity, they can uh, show everything, they can speak about uh, the crimes, but uh, I do not want to give some ideas uh, to the authorities, Polish or Hungarian authorities, but I can imagine that some historians will be asked uh, politely to teach in an um, elementary school somewhere in the countryside, or maybe to leave this Hungary and Poland and leave somewhere else. Yes, uh, they will be fired, but not jailed. Mm -hmm. To be jailed, this means uh, they create martyrs, victims. No, they will be punished. And if they uh, try to apply for a fellowship, they will uh, deny it. To the end, uh, Poland lost the peer battle after the introduction of the Holocaust Bill. On a press tour for foreign co correspondents, its goal was to show how difficult, deadly risky it was Poles, for Poles to save Jews during the war. They showed it Markova, this is a little town. In this small village, a small museum exhibition was created about the anti-Polish family, adults and children alike, who were murdered by the Nazis for sheltering Jews. Unfortunately, some Polish-speaking journalists noticed that the family was denounced, shopped to the Gestapo by their Polish neighbor, and some Polish officers were in the firing squad too. The Oscar-winning movie, Ida, when uh, two years ago was on the program on a, of a state-sponsored TV channel, a well-selected group of Holocaust experts explained to the audience why this film is wrong. It was shown that uh, in a family, Jewish uh, girl was raised, but uh, her brother was killed. Give a false, fake, deceitful picture about wartime Poland and the behavior of Poles. France, that never was never at Vichy, declared the goal. Poland, that was not at Jedwabne. Uh, I will not speak about uh, Jedwabne, uh, but I jump to the final conclusion. The right-wing Polish and Hungarian authorities want Poland and Hungary to be portrayed as victims of the Nazis, heroic allies of Western powers, friends and rescuers of Polish and Hungarian Jewry. The Hungarian kleptocracy, veiled in national colors, is also openly nationalist, europhobe, anti-Semite. Orban is different from his Polish friends only in his Soviet policy. Orban is a puppet and follower of Vladimir Putin. The Polish and Hungarian politicians use history as a tool. They create an enemy, the all-powerful international jury. They defend Poland and Hungary against everybody. Brussels, Muslims, immigrants, George Soros, Jan Grabowski, Jan Gross, Randolph Brehem. And give the people a white washed national history in which there are no crimes and criminals, mistakes, massacres of innocents, collaborators, traitors, 
ethnic cleansing, and they create the sacrosanct national unity. And they are very, very successful. We must be aware that the Polish and Hungarian Holocaust memory policy is very popular, supported by the vast majority of ordinary Poles and Hungarians. The Hungarian and Polish right-wing nationalist populist politicians and their court historians are no cynical manipulators. Perhaps, perhaps some of their historians know that they are lying, falsifying the historical truth, but I am 100% sure that Orban or Kvér, Kac or Kaczynski or Duda are simply uncultured, uninformed politicians who love the power and know perfectly well what the vast majority of their uncultured and uninformed, support, uninformed supporters want to hear. Our nation and its past is great, fine, we have and had always right. They are wrong. Thank you for that. Thank you all three so much. You're going to come back up? That'd be great. I think the sound is going to come on for all the um, these guys. OK. Intense stuff. Somebody like to ask or say something? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, is there a floating mic? Oh, yeah, that would be great. There's one. Do you see it here? The, can you turn the light so that it's coming, the sun is going, is there something to do about the light? <laughs> it's beautiful, but it's also in our eyes. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you all um, for participating. My question is for Laszlo. Um, my family's from Hungary. Um, my father was in hiding in Budapest. He was exposed um, by a Hungarian. And um, I grew up understanding, or how do I say that, the Hungarians were not very friendly to the Jews. And seeing what's going on today and what's happening with refugees not being allowed, where do you see the future of Hungary? I mean, in the sense of ever really coming to terms with whatever happened and with them, um, we're talking about history and how people are teaching history. I, I can't see, as, as an American growing up here, how that will ever change. When I was a student at the university in 1975, I had the chance to, uh, to uh, some 40 years ago, in 1975, I was a student and I had the privilege to go to Moscow for a half a year with a fellowship. And on the first night, uh, we had uh, in the college uh, a visitor, an Estonian young uh, student and uh, we spoke about different things and he asked us do you know what is the difference uh, between an optimist and a pessimist and I we, we never know that maybe you know the the joke at the end of the joke according to the pessimist this is the possible worst state of things according to the optimist no there will be much more worse <laughs> So I think uh, we are not at the end of the tunnel. I even do not see a light at the end of the tunnel. And the tunnel is going down. Mm -hmm. So a few, one day ago, one of my Romanian friends uh, proposed me to ask uh, refugee status in Romania. I am thinking about, and this is not a joke, not to go to Romania, but maybe to Israel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is to Professor Frank Bayor. Uh, you mentioned perpetrators, uh, victims, and bystanders. Do you think, uh, do you think you, we have enough research uh, on bystanders. Uh, I think personally we don't have enough. And uh, do you think in the future we can have more? I, I think it's not that popular, it's not that, 
doesn't make so, so much noise. And what's your opinion of research on bystanders? Um. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I got your question right, but um, um, uh, although I have doubted the, 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 that this category um, is too static to describe social behavior, uh, nevertheless, when you look at um, the social history of the Holocaust and lots of research that has been done, on these topics, um, I think that's that's um, one of the major trends in, in Holocaust uh, historiography to integrate, to, to view the Holocaust as a social process. And then, of course, a kind of re-evaluation of the term bystander comes into view. Uh, I think there's still uh, 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 these categories perpetrators, victims, biters, are of a certain significance, uh, uh, but um, only as rough differentiators. So I, as Rene Poznanski has quite impressively uh, demonstrated uh, when looking at uh, French developments, um, the term is somehow doubtful in so far as it does not pay attention enough to the uh, the, the, the rapid changes of social behavior of the, partly the very same person in various situations. I have started research on, on as the so-called Aryanization of Jewish um, assets. Um, and uh, what I've found quite striking is that many of the so-called Aryanizers who had acquired Jewish businesses and assets uh, quite often rapidly changed their behavior. In the beginning, 1933, they, some of them were ready to, to pay fair prices for Jewish businesses. The very same person two years later could uh, turn out as a completely ruthless exploiter. So how do you then characterize such a person? And of course, it's quite clear that taking part in the exploitation of victims um, is more than uh, so. This, but the bystander word has this passive, this connotation of passivity, and um, when you are part of a of a of a society in which the rulers expect that you take part in the exclusion, the social exclusion mm -hmm. of an unwanted minorities, you cannot be a bystander. Mm -hmm. You're part, even if you decide not not to do anything, you're part somehow of the game. And therefore, mm -hmm. the term bystander, I think, is um, more or less doubtful and should be replaced by a more thorough analysis of social behavior and social action within the whole process of the Holocaust and the persecution of the Jews. Konstantin. Yeah. And you're, you're next. Okay. Oh, and you, can somebody let okay. you sit? Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations, but I uh, want to express uh, a certain discomfort which uh, came up during the last two days, and th this discomfort has to do with, with a kind of self-criticism of our discipline. So in an ideal world of uh, historiography, uh, methodology should be like a torchlight. So we use methodology to, to light in certain corners so that we can see more. And sometimes I, I, I get the feeling that we are rather uh, discussing about methodology like uh, in, in a different way. We are, uh, we are using methodology um, to create new trends in Holocaust history. So Holocaust rather becomes a canvas and we are uh, starting with our professional routines, and then we are starting with uh, transnational turn, spatial turn, gender turn, and so we are applying all our turns to the Holocaust, and so we can st uh, talk about the future of Holocaust research uh, in, in a way that we are waiting for the next turn, and then we will apply the next turn to, to the Holocaust. And what I'm missing is what are, what are the questions and which methodology 
uh, we might apply to answer our questions. I th so there's something which is irritating me when we are <laughs> always talking about these turns and there's another turn and in the future there will probably one more turn. So what do you think about this? Uh, are you this directing conference? that at all three? Or are you, <laughs> wait, are you directing it at all three of uh, them? Well, I think it's a very general question. So okay. uh, in a way, I'm directing the question to myself, but maybe there's something <laughs> more <laughs> qualified uh, on the. <laughs> you want the answer? No, no. I, I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> Do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so whoever wants. Well, I, since, I, since I was talking uh, this afternoon about the turns more, that we have spent quite a lot of time talking about turns already, but um, I, th I mean, I think that we, uh, I mean, we, you know, we don't invent our sort of methodological questions out of nowhere. I mean, we invent them in the, con I mean, we uh, figure out what our questions are in the context of the world we live in, the, the very you know particular spa spaces that we deal with, the people that we are teaching, the uh, the colleagues we work with. I think the point that you were making that you know tra that transnational approach does not mean that the challenges are the same everywhere. Clearly, they are quite you know different in in many ways in in Hungary and Poland at the moment than they are for example in a very multicultural um, American uh, classroom for example uh, so that in that sense I think uh, it actually makes a lot of sense to pay attention uh, to where are we looking I mean I don't think I don't think we discover a turn and uh, and then we take our research there I think we to take our research in certain directions, and then we realize, oh, something has turned. So when I'm, you know, so you know, if for example, if I say I think that we are moving, for example, towards a kind of colonial turn, if you will, uh, that's because I think that there is this very important and exciting new research that is not just thinking about the relationships, for example, between the Holocaust and colonialism in terms of sort of multi-directional memory. It's you know, been talked about as you know, on this kind of cultural studies level, but in very concrete ways, right? You know, how do the anxieties of a British empire constrain and facilitate the possibilities for rescue? How does mm -hmm. a vulnerable Soviet empire think about the way, you know, who it's going to let in and who it's going to let out. I mean, these are, these are not sort of ideas, you know, that we just come up with. We, I think we, there are reasons why we make those choices, why our research changes, and then we say, oh, actually it seems like more and more people are doing this and then we retroactively identify a turn so I, you know i don't i don't think it's so I, I mean i don't i don't think it's so odd maybe the word is strange but i think that's how we work yeah. okay but but it's uh, I, I agree with you in so far as we have to critically evaluate the use uh, of each of these turns uh, because there is a, a, as I see it, a, taking the spatial turn as an example, um, uh, the danger of a certain determinism uh, mm -hmm. that in particular if space is more or less um, equated with geography. So uh, um, some months ago I heard a German colleague, uh, an expert on East European history saying and then the German soldiers entered spaces that were that were contaminated by violence Aye. so and, and, uh, is there a kind of uh, is violence a kind of virus jumping on yeah. the s poor soldiers and then they are starting to killing the or a kind of poison uh, lying there in eastern europe and when they the, the germans invaded these territories they suddenly became violent so that i, I have some doubts that this uh, understanding of space is um, is is really uh, fruitful, 
I would always plead for a more cultural understanding of the word space, integrating the web of social actions and and the social uh, uh, situation within a space into uh, into the term. So otherwise, you end up in, in that kind of um, doubtful determinism. So we always, so I, I more or less, I totally agree with with Atina. We uh, uh, the terms are, terms are there, and we have to to to, to examine are they specifically useful for us. Uh, so is there something new in, in uh, analyzing uh, the Holocaust is, but uh, we should not simply follow everything that comes around the corner, but always have to be uh, cautious as far as uh, achievements and problems are concerned. Yeah. Okay. I see at least three questions, and this lady up front will ask the next one. And then that's, can, can we ask the three and take it all together? People can have individual, but I did see those two hands there, so let's just let her ask. This is a question we'll take the three for together. Laszlo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the, my husband's mother, who passed away in 1958, uh, according to this book by Johnny Moser, published in 2011, she was involved in Vienna with a resistance group that was creating false documents for Polish Jews to escape to Hungary before 1944. Unfortunately, they were discovered when a, a man tried to sell his um, food vouchers, I guess you would call them, to uh, the black market. And he was questioned and he gave them up, these people up. My mother's my husband's mother was the only one who survived from this group. Now I'm wondering how I could find more information about this resistance group, or is there so many uh, small groups that we don't know about because they, she was told by a police officer, they're coming for you, you better destroy all your documents before they find you. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take two more questions and then let Lasla answer you, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you've been waiting for a long time. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, just, we're going to try to, we're trying to do the, that's right. We want to do the three together. Because we're running right. a little well, late. My name is Elizabeth Kosakowska. I'm Polish. Uh, I'm not a historian. I'm a scholar of Russian literature. So my question may be very naive. But um, I see the tension between the, um, approach of historians towards the Holocaust versus the um, witnesses. Mm -hmm. Because um, listening or seeing the witnesses produces an emotional response to Holocaust, mm -hmm. while historians are, by definition, objective and intellectualize the, um, the experience of the Holocaust. Now, considering the efforts of Shah Foundation uh, with the millions of interviews which are put online, the interviews with the witnesses, now, in my mind, they are becoming the teachers of the history. So I see the big tension between the historians versus the witnesses of, um, of the Holocaust, the, the, the tension between intellect and emotion. Okay. So I just wonder where you okay. Okay. stand on this. Okay. Okay. Is it is it okay to wait, save the other questions for later? We need to wrap up because of the live stream. Is that okay? Just let people respond to those too, and then we can all talk later in person. Go ahead, Lasso. Uh, sorry, but uh, the sources are very very rare. In an illegal uh, movements or illegal the partisans or other people who try to to resist to the Hungarian and German authorities uh, mainly in 1944 or before uh, their last efforts was to to document their uh, deeds and uh, thoughts so we have some memories and we have some, um, a few dozens uh, of trial documents when they were captured. 
So I, a few years ago, I published a short article about uh, the Jews and their helpers who try to smuggle people uh, from abroad through Hungary into Romania and through Romania uh, to Palestine. Uh, and uh, some people were captured and they have uh, small trial uh, documents, but uh, not, not too much. Uh, and let me tell you a very few words uh, about the Shoah Foundation. Uh, 57,000 uh, testimonies, according to Professor Yehuda Bauer, so not millions uh, <laughs> put on the, on the net from these uh, testimonies. According to Professor Yehuda Bauer, uh, at least the half of these testimonies is useless. Uh, I do not want... Uh, uh, during the reception, I will tell you some <laughs> words, some phrases. Uh, you, you will be not happy. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, this was not a real uh, scientific work to uh, register su such kind of testimonies. Uh, the, everybody who took part in, in this work uh, got um, uh, maybe 20 or 50 uh, questions. And it was not a uh, in real interview, but an investigation. Your name? where you were born, what you did before the war. And if you don't want to respond or do you want to speak about it, when I first encountered with an anti-Semite, no, I asked you when you lost your father, your job, his job. This is not a scientific work. Okay, can we have the discussion later? Did you want to say I one more thing? I just wanted to say one yeah. word, which is that uh, I think that historians obviously are not um, sort of separated uh, from emotions, or for that matter, from the study of emotions, which is becoming in increasingly important in our research. But I think that the, uh, the, the, the most important point is that we draw so much of our material from witnesses but we are also, I think, increasingly aware of the fact that the witnesses we have are selective mm -hmm. and that there are voices yeah. that have not been heard, that have right. been suppressed, that have been marginalized, uh, that remain to be excavated. Again, I think that there was a whole area having to do with um, sexuality and uh, the uses of sexuality, for example, but also questions to do with uh, collaboration, with a uh, whole range of behaviors uh, have not, in fact, uh, necessarily been already spoken about, and that it is our job, in a sense, to learn from the witnesses, absolutely, but also to dig beyond the witnesses and to find the next mm -hmm. layers and the next layers of sources and witnesses. So I don't think that that sort of binary that you're setting up is actually uh, the work that we're doing, although it's obviously, as Frank already said, it behooves us all the time to be as self-critical uh, and as uh, thoughtful and careful as we can possibly be. Okay, I think that's a really good note to end on. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs>